Olá, my friends, and welcome to beautiful Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I'm happy to be here. We've got a lot to explore, and today we're doing what's going on in Brazil. I'm going to hit you guys with the history, with the politics, and everything in between. My hot takes on this amazing South American country. Let's do it. Brazil, we need to get to know its food first. So today I've got one of the most traditional foods that you can eat in Brazil, it's called feijoada. It's a bean stew that you eat on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and it's like the, the lifeblood of Brazil. So, we have a model for the feijoada here. It's a bean stew with different sorts of salted beef or pork, and then a local kind of sausage, not spicy. It's very, very, very meaty and honestly super, super delicious. They serve it up with farofa, which is a type of local flour that they process into some sort of like topping. I'm really not sure what they use it for. Uh, cracklins, some kale with some, uh, some roasted garlic, and then what they call Greek rice or just uh, just white rice. And that is a plate of Brazilian feijoada. I absolutely love feijoada. What they do here with the beans, it's so rich, super, super delicious. The sides kind of add to it, but don't take away from it. It's probably the best preparation of beans that you can probably have in the world. If you have a better bean dish from your country, you can definitely let me know, but Brazilian feijoada is my number one bean-related dish on the planet. And the beef, or the pork that they put in there, it's always salted, so it has this really nice salty backbone. You never need to add salt, which for uh, a dish, it really covers all the things. It's a little spicy, it's salty, uh, it's like got different textures. It's a really an amazing dish, I will say. Brazilian food? Okay. So let's give it a try. Mm. So good. Whew. Very full. So if you guys want to come to this bar, it's called Bardo Minero Rio de Janeiro. That's the one. There it is. There's the sign. And it's in the Santa Teresa district, which is this nice little hilly area in the uh, near the center of Rio. So now we're in the streets, and I'm gonna tell you about what's going on in this country today. And so I'm gonna highlight something first, and then we're gonna look back in history. So, I think Brazil is one of the most beautiful places you can visit in this entire planet. I mean, Rio de Janeiro has absolutely blown my mind. You get views like this where you get this epic bay, you get the connection to the Atlantic, you get these beautiful mountains, all in this sort of jungle kind of vibe with really, it's very green and it's just, it seems like a land of plenty. But an important thing to notice, I don't know if you noticed, when you're looking this way is that this area is a really good example of why Brazil is struggling and what I imagine is the exact problem with Brazil. So. Here you have like a nice building, although it's kind of in ill repair. You know, they've put a mural on it to make it look nicer, but um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that the building is slowly falling apart. And then here, very important, is very strong looking, very aggressive barbed wire. So while you have all of this beautiful, uh, you know, stuff in the background, the beauty that Brazil has to offer, it's offered up in a place with uh, falling apart buildings and barbed wire uh, security preventions which uh, is basically kind of the Brazil that I have found. So, I mean, even here, a beautiful old building, uh, basically decrepit, shut down, um, tacked, you know, uh, tagged, graffitied, um, with, uh, you know, like kind of wiring infrastructure that's like really not super well taken care of. Brazil's got a lot of problems, but first let's talk about the history. Our story of Brazil starts in the Santa Teresa neighborhood, right in the center. And so, in Rio de Janeiro, it's one of the most historic cities that you're going to find in Brazil. People have been building serious things here since the Portuguese came in the mid-1500s. 
And so I think the story of Brazil is sort of twofold. They have the beautiful colonial buildings that you can find of the ancient Brazil that was defined by incredible inequality. And then you have the modern Brazil, which is not beautiful and also defined by incredible inequality. So if the story of anything in Brazil, it's the story of inequality. And so let's talk about that historically. So I'm not sure you guys can see, but here is a private security booth. And when you're in a richer neighborhood here in uh, pretty much any city of Brazil, you'll find that the, the neighborhood pays for their own private security as the security obviously in Brazil is not very good. So now I'm in a place called Parque de Ruinas, so Ruins Park. And I think this is the perfect place to start our talk about Brazilian history. So here are the ruins. It's an old colonial building. They've got cool Portuguese tiles up on the top here. And so the history of Brazil goes somewhat like this. There were, of course, indigenous people in Brazil for long periods of time. They actually found one of the oldest uh, like remains of a human called a Luisa person, something in that predates to around like 11,000 BC, I think. So something like 13,000 years ago. Very impressive. So people have lived in this area a long, long, long time. The story really starts for Brazil um, in the early 1500s when the Portuguese come and they start to establish settlements all along the coast of what is now uh, current day Brazil. The, since Brazil and the Amazonia region is very hard to penetrate, the Brazilians were really, or the Portuguese were really uh, left kind of safeguarding the coastline until they could explore further. And even now the Amazon is still not incredibly well explored. So we can say that the Brazilians found pay dirt as Brazil is a land of plenty, uh, specifically in rubber, in tobacco, in minerals. So the Portuguese basically took this land, what is current day Brazil, and they used it to exploit its riches. And this became the prize of the Portuguese empire, just like India was the prize of the British empire. The Portuguese started to invest lots of money and resources into building up the uh, Brazilian export of goods. And so that meant importing millions and millions of African slaves. This became one of the biggest slave trade countries in the world. And now Brazil has something like half of its population of almost 220 million people originating from uh, from slave backgrounds. The Portuguese in the 16 and 1700s saw this land as just the opportunity that they were looking for to solid solidify their empire as being as good as the rest. And they decided to exploit it and to create a massive colonial state with very little representation. The 16 and 1700s here in Brazil were really defined by uh, the slave trade by the extraction of resources and by the growing importance of Brazil in the not only the Portuguese Empire but in the Portuguese high society as the Portuguese Empire started to crumble towards the late 1700s as their colonies were not working as well but more particularly as wars in Europe were starting to influence Portuguese society within Portugal in Europe uh, Brazil became much more important in the societal structure of the Portuguese Empire and for something like 30 or 40 years the Portuguese actually sent their monarchy to come live out here in Brazil um, and it was it was sort of a uh, an ultimatum given by the by the French and the British uh, as they were kind of starting to control that whole area the Spanish Empire Portuguese Empire were falling apart so interestingly enough the Portuguese um, monarchy the Emperor at that time was actually living here in Brazil for 30 or 40 years this elevated Brazil from just being a colony to being one of the sovereign territorial states of the Portuguese Empire so when they used to say uh, so when the king used to say that he was the king of Portugal, he used to say he was the king of Portugal, the Algarve, and also uh, of Brazil, as it was uh, now a fully integrated part of the empire. As the king of Portugal left to return to, uh, to, to Portugal from Brazil, he left his son here, uh, Dom Pedro II, I believe, who then became the first emperor of Brazil. As it came time for the Portuguese royal court to return back to its home country of Portugal, uh, this is where this sort of fracture between Portugal and Brazil started as the son of the monarch was left here and then decided to stay, declaring Brazil as its own, um, as its own country and him as its first emperor. This also sort of coincided with the early 1800s, late 1700s push for independence saw in the United States, uh, saw in France and around uh, other countries in Latin America away from the Spanish Empire. 
I'm pretty sure this is the reason why you can find such epic colonial buildings here, specifically in Rio de Janeiro, as it was the capital of both uh, Brazilian, uh, Portuguese Brazil and also just uh, the Brazilian Empire uh, that lasted from like 1810 to 1899. Um, this really became a defining factor of life here. And Brazil kind of became one of the largest and most important countries here in South America and in the South American sphere. So to wrap up the history section of this what's going on in Brazil, the 1800s were the imperial time. There was this overthrow of the imperial government due to all of the pressures from other countries becoming independent. In the start of the 1900s, the Brazilian state, which was basically governed by only land-holding uh, sort of European men, was put into power. It was a democracy, but most people couldn't vote. Um, the 1900s were kind of the rise of the possibility of Brazil being a big power and the letdown of the fact that it just didn't happen. So in the 1930s, they had their first military dictatorship overthrow of their democratic government. They got it back in the 50s. They lost it again for 20 years during the very tumultuous times in the 60s through 80s here in Latin America. And since about 1985 until today, uh, Brazil has bounced between uh, left party governance, right party governance, but uh, basically it's been incredibly ineffective to say the least. For me, Brazil is the land of missed opportunities. This is the most beautiful country. They have amazing coasts, they have amazing tourist opportunities, they have amazing beaches, they have amazing mountains, they have the Amazon rainforest, they have the Pampas region in the south. I mean, it's a massive country with so much potential. And so the question is, why is Brazil not a superpower? It's a massive country with 220 million people, but yet somehow like 30% of their population still lives in extreme poverty with large chunks of their society not even being able to eat food. How is it possible? How is it possible in a country like this? Let me tell you, let me give you my, uh, my ideas. I think the point for me is that Brazil is a country of haves and have-nots. It is the most unequal, shockingly unequal country I've ever been to. Now, Brazil is pretty expensive, I'm not gonna lie, for what it is. Um, if you're in Sao Paulo, you can pay 15 or 20 US dollars for dinner. If you're in Rio de Janeiro, like to go to the Cristo Redentor, it's gonna cost you 20, 25 dollars. And you have uh, something like 30, 30%, 30 40, 35% of this country living in extreme poverty, where most people don't have access to even one or two dollars per day. You have this problem, the favela problem. Um, I'm sure many of you watching have heard of favelas. If you're interested in this video, I'm sure you understand what it is. But favela uh, in old Portuguese used to be like the untouched place or the dirty place. And so now this is a whole swath of Brazilian society where very few people even live in like registered properly built housing. Favela housing was basically a bunch of, it started with originally enslaved, freed enslaved people who had no property, no place to go. They were just kind of left to build their own, uh, their own houses and their own societies as uh, the Europeans certainly didn't want them moving in next to them here in um, uh, the city centers of Brazil. So these favelas started to pop up all over Sao Paulo, all over Rio de Janeiro, and then soon enough all over the country. These favelas were not connected to electricity, they were not collect connected to water, and now they've become centers of crime, um, of desolate situations, of devastation, and the complete failure of a government to provide and protect for its citizens. Brazilians do have money, just not that many of them. Having a car here is very expensive. This is one of the most expensive places in the world to buy um, an iPhone, uh, to buy any sort of technology. There are people who can afford those things, but the majority of people are left desolately unable to. They're so far away from the potential of, of actually accessing normal services and normal, uh, normal lifestyles in this country. It's actually shocking. I mean, the thing is like we have inequality in the US and of course people have millions of dollars and people have uh, not a dollar in their pocket. But the thing is we still have the ability to make $8 an hour, $10 an hour if you can, if you can work. In Brazil, there is no minimum wage for these people. I mean, some people are making less than $1 a day, and they're functioning in a country where it costs $2 for a bottle of water. Strange. For me, 
This comes down to corruption and nothing else. Corruption is the root of all evil in any sort of government system. And here in Brazil, it seems like the corruption that started during the slave period and the Portuguese colonial period never really stopped. People here are unsafe. The streets don't feel comfortable. I'm, there's trash everywhere. It seems like the services don't particularly work very well. It's one of the most inhospitable countries for a tourist that I've personally been in. And I've been to some countries that have had wars and have been in war, uh, that are war zones. Uh, this one's the worst one. Brazilians are very nice people. I'm not gonna say that, but in the three or four days that I've been here, someone's tried to steal my phone out of my hand. Uh, people have been very sketchy on the street. The amount of homeless people that they have here is just so sad. And the amount of desolate, desperate people um, just doesn't make sense in a country or in a, in a place like Ipanema Beach, which is a tourist hotspot. It's really shocking. And you can really see how ineffectual their government is here. And I'm, I'm really saying like, this is the land of missed opportunities. And it's so sad because Brazil is has so much to offer and the people in it can't access any of it. And as a tourist, it's like, it almost feels bad being here to a certain extent because you want to enjoy the things, you want to go have nice dinners, but you're seeing people literally like, like unable to do anything. Like it's almost as bad as India here in a lot of ways and, and in a much more dangerous way. So um, yeah, I'm a little bit shocked. I'm a little bit taken aback to be honest. Driving through the streets of Rio or Sao Paulo, you see Gucci stores, you see Prada stores, you see new shopping centers, you see people driving BMWs. But on the streets you see homeless people and crackheads, you see criminals and just, and homeless children. I mean, if that's not the most unequal society, I don't really know what is. Quick update, I made it to the Cristo Redentor. Terribly touristy, only one place. I would go one time because it's a wonder of the world. Wouldn't come back. You probably do get one of the more impressive views of Rio de Janeiro. You can see all the amazing mountains here. And you can see the Redentor. There he is. Looking over everybody since 1931. If you want to come up here, the train ride is about 20 US dollars. And it's one of the most claustrophobic tourist areas I think I've probably been to because you're all stuffed up here on the top of this uh of this hill but uh it's definitely worth it for, for probably like 30 minutes the original plan after brazil was um independent was to put a statue of uh, queen isabella up here who was one of the queens of uh, the brazilian empire but after the brazilian empire fell the hill was left empty for another 30 40 years until they decided to put up uh this statue to Christ the Redeemer with a uh, with a little heart, uh, kind of as a as an homage to the mountain that it's on, which is uh, Corcovado, which uh, is sort of Latin for "Where is the heart?" So to end the video on a more positive note, I have brought you guys to the viewpoint at Pau de Azucar, or what they're calling Sugar Loaf Mountain here in Rio de Janeiro. Here you can get one of the coolest views of the entire city and you can see the uh, the two sides of Rio this being the more metropolitan side of Rio and then they have this massive bridge that goes across the uh, the bay here and then this is the secondary side of a different city called Itape and you can really see the diversity the beauty of the uh, of the land that they've got here this is one of the most magnificent probably cities that I've ever seen it's one of the most absolutely gorgeous places in the world and it's definitely a place to visit regardless of all the socioeconomic and political problems that they they might have i'm not sure how well you guys can see it but right here on this tip the top of corcovado is where we were just earlier the christ redeemer statue from 1931. and lastly here is the pao de azúcar the sugar loaf mountain uh, the idea of the naming of this is that it looks like a mound of sugar or it can look like a traditional bread, a pau de azúcar that they eat here in Brazil, which is a, a sweet a sweet bread that kind of has this kind of, uh, let's say, leavened look. And it's uh, these cable lines here uh, have been here since uh, the early 1900s, and it was actually one of the first uh, cable cars systems uh, in the world, and one of the first in South America as well, put in by German and Swiss engineers 
uh, in the late 1910s. So from Rio de Janeiro, I want to say thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe, hit the notification bell. We're headed to Paraguay next, so stay tuned for some videos from a country most people do not get a chance to visit. See you later, guys. Adios.